I've been out on this river most of my life, but for this project, we've been out here for 39 days. It'll be 39 days tomorrow, actually. Uh, we've been surveying sturgeon, so that's what we've been doing. The study will show how much uh, sturgeon we have in the rivers and see how they're multiplying and decreasing. Well, this project came about uh, uh, from input from our community members using uh, the Agoki River area and talking about the decline in, uh, in the sturgeon species within, uh, within, within the Agoki River. And uh, our people uh, use that area quite regularly, fishing for sturgeon, pickerel, pike. Uh, a lot of traditional trapping within the area, but uh, over the past while, we've we've started to notice a decline in the in the sturgeon populations. People going out and not catching any, or catching very few, and uh, we wanted to to look and try to find out why that's happening. We we worked with our our team, uh, including shared value in Matawa Four Rivers, and uh, putting together a project to to try to you know try to find out what's going on with this river. We're gonna set up a base camp, which is uh, pretty much gonna be made up of two to three tents, screen tent. You know, have a cook area. Uh, the two technicians will be out there most of the time on their own. Uh, they'll have the biologist who goes out there with them to train them. And then it's going to be up to our community members to, to, do, the, to do the work, you know, to, to set the nets, to, to use those, those meters and uh, all the scientific stuff that uh, they've been trained to do. We've been doing setting nets. Uh, we use six nets, but depending on terrain, we go to four. Um, sometimes we can't use six, meaning that it might be shallow or we want to put nets where it's not supposed to be, kind of thing. And we process fish, uh, walleyes, common mouth, uh, common nose uh, suckers, jackfish, whitefish, and our, but our main goal is the sturgeon. We take a piece of the fin for the genetics and a piece of the dorsal fin and we take a, a, about an inch to an inch and a half of their bone for the aging, for the aging process and it, you don't want to cut them too deep because then you'll, you'll get a lot of bleedings but you just want to take this, a nice little sample out of there and try not to hurt them too much while they're doing it because their bones are really fragile you can crack it eh? and then they're, you don't want to hurt them out there. There's a lot of issues uh, in regards to resource development in the, in the area and uh, we want to look and see uh, if that's uh, impacting things, you know. We, we, we just want answers of what's going on out there and, and then we can take those answers and, and best develop a plan that's, that's going to be best for the, for the fishery. And to be able to properly manage them, you know, it's our ultimate goal is to is to have sturgeon there for the next generation so that they can fish and, and, and use the river the way our elders did. Uh, I haven't been so lucky to, to catch many sturgeon in the river. I actually haven't caught any in, in my time out there. But I'm hoping that with this project that we can actually look and see what's going on with the river and, and give our community some answers on, on, uh, on how things are now compared to how they used to be. A lot of elders are pretty interested in in seeing these populations come up and and just trying to find out what exactly is happening on the river. For the elders, uh, you know, it's uh, it's something that they would eat during feasts and and you know uh, at that time of year when when they catch them, uh, usually uh, spring, early summer, they uh, you know they would 
they would carve it up and either boil it or fry it and they would spread it around the community so a sturgeon can feed about four or five families. Yeah, it's, if it's bigger, even more, you know, and it's just a, a celebration of, of sharing and, and being together. Some people cook it fry, like pork chop style, and some of them boil it. About 100 people can eat one fish, they're big ones. <laughs> When I went in the first time, when they told me, let's go sturgeon fishing, I never had, a, I never know what kind, how the sturgeon looks like. So we set a net, next morning we caught some sturgeon, and I told my wife, ah, oh, Jesus, should try that. I had it for breakfast and dinner and supper three times. It's the first time I ever see a sturgeon in my life. <laughs> I really enjoyed it when I was over there at the Gokie River. When we catch a sturgeon, it's just like a big occasion to let people use turkey and Christmas, same thing. If we catch one, we all share and cook it together. You get to go on that this young year and get in the My dad did that. Any kind of fish, my dad is good. I talked to a number of elders, and I, I know we, we did some interviews with them that how it was back in the day, the Agoki was, was a thriving river, they had a thriving fishery commercial fishery, they had a thriving everything. At one time, we, they used to say that they would see the sturgeon coming up the spawn and they would see their backs and things like that. And you can almost count the amount of sturgeon that were in each spawning area. And that doesn't happen anymore. My dad did the uh, fishing there for Austin Airways before. The, that's when there was a lot of sturgeon in the lake at that time. Like that's when I was going with my dad to go check nets and that. And I did it after when I got grown up a little bit, not that much. No, because nobody was buying, we were just catching what we were, eat, what we were eating. That's about it. But there was a lot of sturgeon then that time. I'm talking about uh, the 60s. You know, when they were doing commercial fishing that uh, over there, you don't have no freezers or ice houses that uh, so when they caught sturgeon, they would keep them alive by uh, tying them up. And us uh, stupid being kids uh, would uh, pull on the string and uh, untie the, the, uh, the sturgeon and it would take off. There was sort of a, a guideline that they used to use to sell. Eh? I think it was, uh, it wasn't for pound, it was uh, measured in inches. I think it was 21 inches that was marked on uh, boats with uh, anything under that, that size they didn't keep. I used to see them throw a lot, those small little ones. On, they said it's too small. The whole family would go over there the whole summer and we would spend the whole summer in a Gokie Lake. They started letting that water go at the dam, that wall moose dam. That's when I started noticing the difference in wild, like on the, on the pop, uh, fish population. When I let the water down there, eh, it, it gets all muddy, and, um, and the fish don't want to stick around there. We were very concerned with the first year that we didn't catch much. I think I think it was like 11 sturgeon that we caught. Yeah, varying sizes. Uh, we had uh, small little ones. Uh, uh, we, we even caught a small sturgeon in the net. We didn't expect to catch one, which was um, uh, uh, the, the gill net, uh, monofilament net that had uh, different mesh size panels. Um, we were pulling that net up uh, the one uh, nice sunny morning and there was a little tiny sturgeon in there. So that was, um, I was very happy for me to find, uh, to see a small one um, and also catch a large ones um, because that gives us a little bit of information that there are 
subsequent levels of um, age structure within that population that we were observing. Uh, every uh, sturgeon I was out there and captured with them, um, we were able to return to the wild with no harm done. And uh, it really kind of said, we said, okay, well, we can measure the first year against the second year and, and, and see what we come up with if we catch the same fish, if we're catching different fish, if we're catching no fish. This year we were not successful at all. We caught two or three sturgeon and that was it. We got pulled off the river when uh, they released the dam. After the dam was released, we noticed our, our fish catch uh, dropped drastically. Uh, uh, we had a lot of problems setting nets. We had a lot of debris in the water, really dirty water. Um, it was just, it was pretty tough, tough going to, to try to sample within those, uh, that time, so. We noticed uh, a huge drop in the, the amounts of fish that we were catching. Uh, before the dam was let out, the fishing was pretty good. The guys were catching 20 to 30 fish uh, every net. Well, this is walleye, pike, whitefish. Uh, you know, we only caught a few sturgeon this spring, summer. So, so there was that issue. Uh, then all of a sudden, after the, after the the dam was released, uh, our catches dropped down to about six, eight fish. So some nets had nothing. And uh, it, it was, it was kind of really hard to, to do what we were doing out there. After that dam was closed, there was no water. And it's very, very little. And you're, you're, in our mind, you're affecting those fish. In regards to sturgeon, you get this, you get this, wa the water comes up, you know, it's right during their, their spawning time as well. Uh, these fish will go into certain areas to spawn. Then the water levels drop two, three, four days after, a week after. And then they're either landlocked in certain areas and then they die or, or eggs and whatever, wherever they're spawning in these areas, they get landlocked. We ran into areas where there wasn't more than four inches of water to going up the river. And if you have a big sturgeon, he isn't going to swim through that. And what happened with us, it, it made it impossible for us to get up river because you're running into a portage that is 250 meters long and it's, and it's a, a couple inches deep and it's nearly impossible to drag your boat up, motor, all your gear to get up, only to be hit by another rapid. I really think there needs to be better management of those water levels and, uh, and, and a more progressive way of releasing the water, spreading it out over time. And, and I, I, I think that ecosystem would be, would be better off doing something like that. You always have to respect those sort of species, like the sturgeon itself was uh, in a way like almost like human to the native. I think there should be a conservation area. Being a First Nation uh, person, uh, it, to me it is important that we protect the wild and yet that uh, we have to make room for development. But uh, to make sure if any kind of development that is going to take place within the, uh, our Mother Earth is that uh, we do everything to uh, make sure uh, to have prescriptions that are uh, healthy for the environment and the, uh, uh, and the animals. That anything that is being done that you don't ignore sturgeon, you know how sensitive, sensitive that is and that uh, uh, in, in any kind of development that does come first, that you know it, it has to have a means to protect stirs. It would be nice to see a sturgeon come back in my lifetime because I used to remember we used to live on. We'll be writing a community management plan, making recommendations to our community members. 
but we'd also like to make rec recommendations to the Ministry of Natural Resources. We'd like to make recommendations to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and we'd like to make recommendations to OPG on how we feel that that this river should be managed. Because right now, all of our water is being diverted to Niagara Falls, and uh, and and it's taking water away from our resources. So our people are having issues in 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 exercising their rights, and and you know that shouldn't be the case. There should be a there should be a plan working together to to manage water levels better. Um, I'd like to see monitoring uh, happening more and uh, understanding how the water is alive, uh, understanding how the land and water function together, understanding the chemistry of the water, understanding population dynamics, understanding um, every bit of life that we know of in that water, and um, to relate that, uh, I think this is very um, important. I think there's management uh, water level regimes in Lake Nipigon that, that they use. They should be some on the other side of the Agoki River as well because our river is very important to us and, and our livelihood is really important to us. So I think, I think there needs to be some give and take there. I think we can work together to better manage those water levels instead of just having one extreme on one side and, and another extreme on another side. And, and then our people are caught in the middle.